Well met, my good gentlefolk. Welcome to Shakespeare Simplified, more specifically, the first episode of Sonnet Sundays. So, if you don't know, the plan for Sonnet Sundays is to go through all 154 of Shakespeare's sonnets and have a in-depth look at them. One a week coming out, weirdly enough, every Sunday. However, before we do that, I thought it's probably sensible to go over and have a look at exactly what a sonnet is and provide some clear background information about what exactly Shakespeare's sonnets are about. So, basically, a sonnet is a poem. Such a revelation, I know. More specifically, a sonnet is a poem with a specific structure consisting of 14 lines, all of which are in iambic pentameter meaning they contain 10 syllables each. Now, it's more specific than that, but I'll go into iambic pentameter in a separate video because it's fairly central to most of Shakespeare's works. So the sonnet as a form originated in Italy in the 13th century, but really got going with a man named Petrarch. He was an Italian scholar and humanist who wrote love poems to his beloved Laura, often comparing her to angels and goddesses, despite the fact they only actually met just one time. Yeah, he was a tad needy, was old Petrarch. So the sonnet stayed mainly an Italian thing till the late 1500s, when bored English noblemen with, you know, nothing better to do with their lives, started ripping them off. Primary among them was a one Sir Philip Sidney, though he retained much of Petrarch's original style and form. Whereas Shakespeare, who was seemingly never content to just be mediocre at anything, completely reworked and revolutionised the way in which sonnets were written, and then produced the largest tract of sonnets ever seen in the period. You know, at the same time as penning more than 30 of the most beloved plays in history. Just as you do. And there's a reason we distinguish between the Petrarchian and the Shakespearean sonnet. The primary difference between the two is the difference in rhyme structure and grouping of lines. So the Petrarchian sonnet consists of groupings of eight lines, an octave, following an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A rhyme scheme. Uh, just to clarify, each letter marks the sound at the end of the line. And if the letter matches, then the lines rhyme. This octave is then followed by a grouping of six lines, a sestet, following a rhyme scheme of C, D, C, D, C, D. Traditionally, a question or proposition is set up in the octave and then resolved in the sestet. By contrast, a Shakespearean sonnet is split into three quatrains, a quatrain consisting of four lines. The sonnet then ends with a rhyming couplet. Each quatrain has its own rhyme scheme on alternating lines. So it goes A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then obviously ending with the final couplet G, G. The Shakespearean sonnet still retains the traditional question and resolution aspect from the Petrarchian sonnet, but changes it slightly. There's more of a focus on the build-up, as each quatrain usually addresses a different aspect of the certain problem presented, and this problem is then resolved rather succinctly in the final couplet. So, picking a very obvious example with the Shakespearean sonnet, because I think it's useful to see how it works in practice, I'm going with the generic and basic choice of sonnet 18, the most popular of Shakespeare's sonnets. Of course, some people are going to say that 116 is the most famous sonnet, but to those people I say, shut up. Just because it gets read at weddings a lot doesn't make it the most popular. So, starting with the first quatrain. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a day. So in the first quatrain of this sonnet, we see the author lament that comparing their lover to nature is inadequate. The description doesn't do them justice. Now the second quatrain. Sometimes you hot the eye of heaven shines, 
and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair some time declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. So this quatrain sees the theme continued upon, with the poet explaining that the inadequacy is because everything in nature will eventually die and fade, and their lover is too perfect for that description. Now the third quatrain, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. This final quatrain deals with the next logical step of the problem. If nature eventually dies and fades, so will the poet's lover. But the author seems to be slightly in denial of this, which we'll see resolved with the final couplet. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. This explains and resolves the problem, as the lover will ultimately live on in the words of this very poem, which will preserve their beauty long after they have died, which indeed they have, as I'm reading it to you now, 400 years after it was written. If you, you will have noticed, of course, that each of these lines does contain 10 syllables each. I am a pentameter. Watch out for that, because it's all over Shakespeare. So, now we've covered the basics of what a sonnet is, and the literary conventions that are often associated with it. Though, don't worry, we'll get more detailed. English nerds, I've got your back, don't worry. But before we do any of that, I'd like to focus on some more contextual information about Shakespeare's sonnets, specifically. So, his collection of 154 sonnets was published in 1609, but was almost certainly written long before then, given the many, many references of the sonnets made by contemporaries prior to this date. There are undoubtedly more sonnets he wrote, but alas, they've been lost. So, you know, we're going to stick with what we've got. Now, the important thing to get out of the way first is that all these sonnets, with a few arguable exceptions, are love sonnets. This is fairly uncontroversial, as most sonnets were of the romantic variety, and in fact still are. Which, thinking about it, does frame the sonnet at the end of my videos in a bit of a different light. Don't worry, I love you all, just not in that way. There is a question as to whether these sonnets are autobiographical, as in they reflect Shakespeare's true feelings in life, or are simply a commission, a fictitious account he made up. And the answer is impossible to determine. However, there is undoubtedly an overarching story and several recurring characters that show up throughout different sonnets. The first 126 sonnets are all addressed to a fair youth. Presumably a young attractive man, either imagined by or known by Shakespeare. Regardless, he is clearly the object of the poet's affections and despite some attempts in the Victorian era to cleanse any homoerotic undertones, I think you have to be fairly blind not to see they are all very, very romantic in nature. So, this leads to a question that scholars have argued over for literal centuries. Does this mean that Shakespeare was gay? Now, we do have to bear in mind that this may have been some kind of fiction or commission, not Shakespeare's actual life and feelings, but even if that's the case, it does suggest these kind of relationships were common and known to him, otherwise he wouldn't have been writing it. Some have argued that men in Elizabethan England had very close and flowery friendships, which is true, but does seem like a bit of a cop-out, because some of these sonnets are very intense, and there are 126 of them. If we, for the sake of argument, take the opinion that these sonnets are in some way autobiographical, we also have to bear in mind that if Shakespeare was having off with this man in London, he was married by this point to Anna Hathaway, who was presumably still in Stratford while he was in London. So, you know, that's kind of dodgy either way. Basically, the answer to Shakespeare's sexuality is that we don't know and probably never will know. But it is a distinct possibility, and if you want to think that way for your own peace of mind, then more power to you. Regardless, by Sonnet 127, 
the poet's affections have switched from the fair youth to the dark lady. Now, whether this lady is dark as in has dark hair and slightly darker complexion and was normal, or the more interesting theory that she was of African descent is unknown. Scholars have speculated over her identity for as long as they've been arguing over Shakespeare's orientation. We know it's possible she could have been of African descent. There was a record of an African woman being present at the first performance of The Twelfth Night, and we know Shakespeare wrote about such themes as can be seen in Othello, for example. But again, as with everything in Shakespeare, we haven't actually got a clue. He is, as ever, infuriatingly mysterious. It can be very tempting and fun to construct a narrative of Shakespeare's love life using the sonnets as a basis, and while that is a perfectly valid interpretation, it's not one I'm going to focus on myself. If you're looking for that, may I suggest the excellent five-part series by fellow Shakespearean YouTuber, The Unweeded Garden. Not only has he got a brilliant name, but he's also made a fantastic overview of the narrative arc the sonnets create. I am going to focus more on the poems individually rather than as a series, though I will occasionally acknowledge the continuity of them when it is necessary. I'm going to dig more into the techniques and language employed in each of them rather than drawing lines to Shakespeare's life. After all, whether these poems are autobiographical is in a kind of way irrelevant. What makes them so good is the content, not whether they are actually true or not. And boy, is the content something. It's been said that every feeling and thought one can have about love can be found in these sonnets, and I'm inclined to agree with that. They are just so human. There's no godly comparisons or grand classical allusions like in Petrarch stuff. They are the thoughts of any other person, any other man or woman. There's passion, naivete, rejection, self-doubt, jealousy, adoration, teasing, obsession, arguments. If you've ever been in a relationship, you'll be able to empathise with most of what's been written down in these sonnets. Despite being poetry of such a flowery period, it feels so extremely down to earth. I personally am quite glad we don't know who they were written for, because it allows us to put our own situation on top of them. It makes them truly universal. So, now we've covered all that, I think we might be ready to start working through them. We'll start with Sonnet 1, shocking, I know, beginning next week. And afterwards we'll just keep going until we hit the end. So, do give this video a like, and if you've ever wanted a skinny British theatre nerd to explain in far more detail than is strictly necessary, 154... 400 year old poems written by a dead man then do stick around and subscribe alack the day when one begins to beg when the powers above thou hast to bribe but if thou this fine channel wish to peg then good fellows i implore you subscribe alas but still thou shalt not be informed if this author a tale he has to tell my heart would thus be eternally warmed if like cries of yore thou rings the bell last if thou finds an item thou dost enjoy allow me yet another deal to strike thine patronage i would seek to employ therefore fine friend feel free to drop a like but now we end and i wish thee luck and pray thou friends forgive this rambling 